Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage, music and calendar, new visions and voices, coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Good evening. You are tuned to Apex Express tonight on KPFA 94.1 FM. We're your hosts for this for this evening, Ranjita Giesler and Kyung Jin Lee. And tonight we talk about media access. What are the mainstream and even the progressive media saying about us? What impacts does this have on how we see ourselves? And what does the one-way flow of information have? <laughs> And how, can, how can we participate with our own voice? And we speak with Peter Kim of the East Bay Asian Youth Center and Streetside Productions. Also, we have in the studio Eloise Rose Lee from Media Alliance and RJ Lasada of SUMCAN, South of Market Community Action Network. And later in the show, we speak with Miho Kim, a local Zainichi Korean activist, about the struggles with ethnic communities in Japan, plus music and upcoming events in the Bay Area. So stay with us. The discussion of Asian representation in the media has been happening for many years now. We all know those stories and images that come at us every day from the television or movies, and they have little to do with the true realities of what we and our communities are facing. But now there are ways to break free from that one-way flow of information and respond. The decentralization of media gives us the tools and the opportunities to talk back in our own voice. Rangita spoke with Peter Kim earlier today. He is the managing director of Streetside Productions at the East Bay Asian Youth Center in Oakland for the last 10 years. Peter has worked with hundreds of youth on uh, making media and documenting their stories through film. Peter begins by talking about the different media tools that are available for people to tell their own stories. You have different communities, different folks, particularly young folks, uh, who are taking advantage of that and creating different ways to communicate and express themselves, whether it be music, whether it be video, uh, radio, television. And, and I think it's powerful. I think it's incredibly powerful because now we're at a point where uh, people are able to express themselves and represent themselves the way they want to be seen and heard. And I think that's important because if you continue to have this one-way communication you'll constantly have uh, the media go out and speak about people of color, um, speak about communities and their struggles, but not always speaking with those communities, not really speaking with those people of color. And even when they are speaking with them, when they go out to the field and they interview folks, it's almost like this approach of anthropologists where they're kind of looking at communities from the outside in, um, talking to them, getting you know, sound bites or, or whatnot, to go ahead and feed an issue that that's on their agenda. But then they go back to studios, cut stuff up in the editing room, and then put out a message that really isn't that of the community or that of uh, the people they spoke to, but it's really uh, of the media producers, whether it be young people like the folks I work with or just people in general who are able to create their own media. Uh, they're able to craft the kind of message or express the type of ideas that they want to have um, told. And, and I think that's crucial. I think that's critical if you ever want to have any kind of meaningful dialogue, uh, promote understanding, and promote growth between communities and within communities. How about for your personal life and how media has transformed parts of your life to get you where you are today working with folks? You know, born and raised in San Francisco, um, I was a young person that was surrounded by whatever media was thrown at me. Uh, I grew up around hip-hop music, grew up around uh, television, movies. So, you know, all those things impacted me in some way or another and influenced the way, uh, you know, the way I, I lead my life. And I grew up with very few images of Asian Americans on television or on the screen. I uh, never heard Asian American voices over the radio. And um, I definitely noticed that. I felt that. Uh, I grew up in the Western edition. In one way, you know, I grew up around a lot of black folks and you know, a lot of black communities. But on the other hand, we had Japantown right there. We had a lot of Asians there. But you never really saw... Asians, other than the ones that are made at the grocery market or the restaurants, you never saw them on TV, you never saw them on the radio. So it had an impact on me. Um, it, it did push me to want to 
advocate for more avenues, more opportunities for young Asians to uh, put themselves out there and express themselves. Uh, going to school out here at, at Berkeley, uh, again, saw a lot of Asian folks on campus, obviously, but um, for various and different reasons, you didn't see a lot of Asian folks actually putting themselves out there when it was um, it was time to uh, rally around an issue. And if they did, it, it happened to sometimes be a quieter voice. And I think that's just because a lot of Asians are, are conditioned to feel that they need to take a backseat off into the more articulate or the more attractive voices. And those tend to be folks that aren't people of color or if they are in you know, oftentimes uh, African-American communities. But even then, I think the media shapes the African-American image a certain way. So all that, I think, has influenced uh, me, myself, personally. Uh, What was the process of finding your voice? Like, I can do this. What I have to say or represent is important. I I can definitely say working with the young people at Ibasi. I've been there for about 10 years now. Um, I think young people tend to be the most honest and sincere folks when it comes to communicating things, ideas, and expressing themselves. So I I take that as an example. Uh, I think as adults, we learn so many different ways to disguise ourselves and our thoughts and say what's acceptable, what's right. Young people just say what's on their mind. Um, I, I, I learn from that every day. Having my own kids, uh, myself, and you see these little, these little babies grow up to be speaking individuals and then they develop their own personalities and characters. And, and having to be a father to those kids, um, I've had to learn to know what it is I'm trying to communicate to them, what it is I'm trying to say to them. So I think all those things have definitely um, helped me learn how to, uh, as you say, find myself in my voice. That's the voice of Peter Kim, who's the managing director of Streetside Productions at EBC. And folks are coming through with different messages from what they see, what they're feeling, what they're going through. This expression could be transformed into a healing tool. Do you see it as that in your work? Uh, absolutely. The youth that we work with are all high-risk youth. Uh, we work p- almost primarily with kids who are on probation and referred to us by their POs. We have kids who are uh, chronic truants or dropouts or pushouts from the schools. We have kids who are who have been sexually exploited. Just the the process of giving them a safe place to come to learn skills and achieve some kind of success and then actually producing something that is relevant and that's important, I think that's huge. It gives young people a sense of purpose. It instills confidence. They know that they can actually do something um, that is respected by not just their peers but by you know older folks. Um, in addition to video, we have young people uh, and we have them lead projects around mural arts and an installation art project that's actually currently at the Oakland Museum uh, of California. And that was a few months of just kids going into room and painting objects, getting on canvas and and painting a mural. And you'd be amazed what just sitting in a room for two or three hours with a paintbrush in your hand um, would do to engage kids in a conversation that you wouldn't think would have happened. I mean, we're not pushing an agenda or or we're not trying to encourage a certain type of discussion. It's just kids are in a room together and they already have these things in their mind. So for a couple hours a day, they're coming in here saying, I don't have to worry about the stuff that's plaguing me outside of this this center, the stuff that went down at school or the stuff that's going on in my home. And it's just a quiet space. But those things are still on the mind, so they tend to come out and then kids talk about it. And it's kind of like group therapy by accident. All the different things that we do, whether it's video, graphic art, mural art, these are different tools to engage youth and to get them to really process some of the things that are going on in their minds. And you mentioned diversity in media and it takes a lot of effort to bring diversity into progressive media, talk back to mainstream media, and just bring that issue forward when mm-hmm. a lot of people are doing good work. It still takes a conscious movement of people to diversify the media and make space for mm-hmm. our own messages. Um, I think what's amazing right now is, is particularly young people, is, you know, they're, they're putting out their own messages. You have things like MySpace and YouTube, and they're creating videos, you know, music, and pushing out these images of themselves on their own as wholly their own. And at Ibasi, we try to do that as well. We're actually giving cameras to young people and letting them go out and find stories. Uh, currently, we have a group of young filmmakers are working on a project that we call I Ain't Leaving, and it's about uh, a group of uh, young Cambodian-American folks who have grown up in an apartment complex called Oak Park Apartments, which is in the 20s of Oakland. And uh, it used to be basically just a real rundown project tenement apartment complex, uh, with horrible conditions. Uh, but then the parents were actually brought together and organized through some uh, missionaries that had come into the community. And they fought against the slumlord and they won this huge lawsuit that renovated the entire apartment complex. 
what that did was it created a much cleaner, safer, physically better uh, environment. Kind of the, the byproduct of that is that it, it completely killed a sense of community that was there before, where everyone kind of rallied around this sense of that they were all living in this messed up place. Uh, and then you had folks always in the courtyard uh, playing music, sharing food with one another. Kids were being raised by aunties and neighbors and cousins and uncles. Now they got black gates up, video cameras. Um, you know, you, you need a certain code to get in. So I think a lot of the residents feel a little uh, disempowered and marginalized in their own homes. In regards to how the young people are affected, these young kids who at the time were, what, three, four, five, six years old, and they were the reason why a lot of these changes had occurred because they wanted it to be safer for these young people. Now they're 14, 15, 17. Um, They're getting pushed out because neighbors are saying, you're hanging out here, you're playing music too loud, you're smoking, you're drinking, you're gambling. The cops come in and cops are making regular rounds and pushing them out. Um, so, you know, those young people now are feeling like we're not welcome in our home, in the only community that we've ever known and that we can call our own because the Oak Park Apartments really is this kind of a, a oasis of Cambodian culture uh, in Oakland. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, that's a pretty complicated issue because, I mean, on one hand, you've got young people who are doing things that aren't always appropriate or legal, but that is still their only safe space in, in their eyes and it is their community. Uh, so is the answer to strictly just call the police and, and kick them out? Or at this point, what they're doing now is putting pressure on the owners of the building to actually evict families who uh, have young people that are involved in these activities. Um, this kind of issue is something that we say, look, if this is something that you feel is important, which it was to two youth in particular who actually come from that area, and they came in one day just real mad talking about are uh, they trying to evict my auntie because they say that, you know, I was doing this or doing that, but what's that have to do with my auntie? Kick me out, don't kick her out. And then that kind of just steamrolled into a more conversation about what was going on over there. We said, well, why don't we make a movie about it? It was a very short youth-produced piece that was pretty rough, um, but it actually uh, definitely has some legs underneath that. We said this can actually become something bigger. We got funding from the California Council of Humanities to make a longer piece on it. And so for the past year, these kids tried to develop this into a longer piece. And that's screening Friday the 27th at the Eastside Arts Alliance, which is over on uh, East 14th Street and 24th Avenue, I believe. It's going to be from 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, it's still a work in progress because um, th- there's just so much to this story. But we have an, a nicely assembled piece that we're ready to screen next Friday. And we're inviting all the folks from the Oak Park community as well as anyone else who wants to just come and, and see what that movie is about. But that's, that's a real good example, I think, of young people um, bringing up an issue that was important to them uh, personally and, and was affecting them uh, and their families. And we really kind of pushed them to think a lot more critically about it. It was a long process of getting these kids to the point where it wasn't strictly about us against the cops, but now it's a bigger community issue. And, and you know, there are lots of times where... You know, uh, I have a, a filmmaker and instructor, C.B. Smith Dahl, who is working with that group. There are many times where, you know, I think she felt compelled to step in and re-edit or guide some of the editing and, and help kind of craft their voice. But, you know, to her credit, she consciously said, no, I'm going to step out. I'll help guide this group to where they want to get to. But even if the message isn't exactly what, as adults, we may feel is the right message, it's the young people's message. So you got to respect that. Um, and in the end, you can say, with honestly, this is a youth perspective on an issue that's affecting youth. So this screening is going to take place on June 27th at the East Side Arts Alliance, and it's the community screening of I Ain't Leaving. And what time is the screening at? The screening is from 7 to 8.30. 7 to 8.30. Mm-hmm. That's Peter Kim. He's been joining us from Streetside Productions of Ebasi. And you want to give out some contact info for folks? Yeah. Our website is www.ebayc.org, ebasi.org. And if you ever want to just give us a call, you can call me at 510-533-1092, extension 33, or you can email me at pkim at ebasi.org. All right, we're going to go out with a short excerpt from I Ain't Leaving. Thanks again, Peter Kim, for joining us tonight. You are tuned in 94.1 FM, Apex Express, and we'll be right back. I look at Old Party as a good place, man. You feel me? Good ass place to be, man. It's home. It's nice to be here. This is where I live. This is where I was raised. Because, man, the police would get on your ass. Just basically getting in our caves and stuff like that when we're not even doing anything. When the police is out there, we cannot go nowhere by Oak Park. They gonna tell us to leave. Camera, all of them go for harassing us. Who that? Hey! 
I mean, they can come here all they want, they can come jackets all they want, they ain't gonna find nothing. We just wanna come over here, play chess, kick it, chill with our friends, a little female friends or whatever. Police always come in and out every day, and I was running stuff thinking that like we doing something, selling drugs and all that. And we are back, and that was an excerpt from Streetside Productions' film, I Ain't Leavin'. Again, the screening is taking place at the Eastside Arts Alliance, our cultural center, 2277 International Boulevard on June 27th, and that event starts at 7 p.m. And you are listening to Apex Express here on KPFA 94.1 FM. We are your hosts. I'm Kyung Jin. I'm here joined with Rangita Giesler. We're going to continue our conversation on media access and accountability. We have live in studio with us two dynamic media advocates and media makers. Eloise Rose Lee is the project director of broadband, of broadband access at Media Alliance and we're also joined by RJ Lozada uh, who is an award-winning filmmaker working with SOMCAN, South of Market Community Action Network. Thank you both for coming through. So we just heard Peter speaking of the importance of media, people taking media and making their own media and being represented in media, through their own voices. And he talked about what brought him into this work, which um, which is media activism, and that he he came up and he didn't see his own reflection in the media or even of Asian communities reflected accurately in the media. So I want to just start with you, RJ. What what sparked you? When did it start where you wanted to be involved in making media? Uh, It really started with this kind of breakage, this breaking point where um, writing becomes a very isolated thing and that process being interrupted by a stranger and their inquiry um, happened at a 24-hour donut shop and this woman asked what I was doing and I I just asked about her and, and, and this act of listening and really taking in her story was uh, really powerful and so it's just, for me it was the act of listening that actually made me want to produce material. What was it? Um, like, why? Why? Mm-hmm. Um, what was the shift that happened where you're like, okay, I can be part of this? Because it's not an easy shift that takes no, place. No, it's not. It's not. Um, I think, uh, well, for that particular experience, uh, I listened, and then that kind of catalyzed me to take a, a good look at my education, uh, where I received my film education, and I looking at my peer group and realizing how stilted (laughs) my education was becoming because I wasn't sharing it. Um, And then I also recognized, like like Peter Kim did, um, that I wasn't being represented uh, and that other people of color weren't being represented. And I I threw myself out there um, looking for a home, and there were organizations around San Diego that gave me that home to explore that. And you're also, you're here now and you're doing documentary work with different, um, well, with the Manila Heritage Foundation and other right. organizations documenting Asian stories. Right, right. Stories that have long been in the the historical narrative, but not uncovered and not shared and not stored, you know. So We'll get into that more mm-hmm. as the interview progressive. I wanted to talk with Eloise and hear what sparked you and how did that process begin? Wow, um, you know, that's such a hard question. <laughs> you know, how does one come into the work one does? You know, it's, um, I feel like it's a culmination of a lot of things, you know. I think, um, I think everyone in this room, you know, we're moved to do the things we do, um, not just because of issues of representation or misrepresentation, but also, you know, having this understanding that media, um, has such a tremendous impact, you know, for talking about, you know, community change, meaningful change, social justice, you know, you have to talk about media and who controls that and who's a part of that process. Um, so I think that's something we all share. Um, in terms of me, like my story, <laughs> I think it has a lot to do with um, growing up in Hawaii. You know, it's um, like growing up in Hawaii, like I was born and raised there. Um, 
in many ways, it's it's a very insular sort of place, you know, because it is an island, yet it's the 50th state. And I think in many ways, you know, it's it's very much isolated and detached from the so-called quote-unquote mainland USA, you know. So um, while on one hand, you know, we're very much the gateway into the Pacific and into Asia. Um, and so in terms of culture, you know, there's there's very much a mix of these sort of influences, these these Asian influences, Pacific Islander influences. But it's not um, you don't see that when you turn on your TV and he's growing up, when you listen to the radio, you know, like what you see it, God, growing up was like facts of life, you know, um, uh, different strokes. I mean, that, you know, was interesting. Different strokes is interesting, actually. <laughs> but still, <laughs> I won't get into that. But, um, but you know, just just these stories and and seeing all this, you know, seeing all these these shows, which on one hand I really enjoyed. It was like, wait a second, you know, where are the Asians, right? And then Asians started coming up and, you know, always playing these sort of roles. And, um, you know, it's always unsettling. And I think also, um, compounded by that, um, the fact that Hawaii is a tourist based, I mean, it's a tourist based economy that sustains, you know, uh, the 50th state. So, um, that in itself is part of, complex streams of of information that is in no way about uh the communities themselves it's it's you know there is issues in terms of objectifying certain things about hawaii and what that looks like that was also unsettling that i would see driving past billboards you know watching commercials for different hotels and different vacation packages you know it's always unsettling but i could never quite articulate that feeling and it wasn't until i left hawaii when all of these sort of things kind of uh kind of came together through the sort of things that I was reading at the time. Like the first time I really, really left Hawaii was when I went away for school, you know, and, and so it was, it was interesting to have us to gain this other sort of sense of what it means to live in Hawaii through the gaze of other people. And I think um, like that process led me to really go into media, you know, in, in different ways, you know, um, so, you know, having gone through some, you know, different kind of film training and stuff, um, like RJ, I also have a background in film, um, a, an academic sort of training, um, but also in terms of, you know, how I wanted to plug in, you know, it's, um, and, you know, in different ways, it led me to the work that I'm doing at Media Alliance, which is really about using media as a tool, you know, for change and what that means. That's the voice of Eloise Rose Lee. Also with us is RJ Lasada, and we're talking about media activism and media action. And Eloise, you're actually the broadband coordinator at Media Alliance, and you're really focusing on um, policy and bringing media activism and, and organizations together to help create networks and um, multi-pronged and multifaceted uh, places where people can communicate. What why is it important that that one way flow of information turns into a multi flow of information? You know, um I think um what Peter Kim from Basie, you know, talked about this uh the flow of information is important. I think um more and more um just the nature of our world is is really about the consumer. You know, it's really about free markets, right? It's about this culture, this 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 consumer culture and um you know that's in one way you know oftentimes when people think of media um it's that which we consume right i mean they don't they don't frame it in that way but when you watch commercials right when you're on bart and you see these ads you know when you're on the radio and you listen to more commercials you know you flip through a magazine you have to flip through the first like 10 pages before you can get to the actual stories you know we're constantly inundated by by images you know and and it's not necessarily things that we connect with but just being barraged by these images you know information um and that's the one-way flow where you're just consuming, right? Um, and the work that I do is is not just about consuming, you know, but it's really about enabling people to produce, right, to produce their own content. 
Um, so that way, the viewer isn't just the consumer. It's also the producer, you know, and I think um, and that's with with the sort of technologies that are out there right now, especially with the Internet. And, and again, you know, Peter talked about this, you know, with um, the emergence of like YouTube and Blink TV, you know, these sort of spaces, you know, people have that power. There is that potential, you know, to, to produce content, you know, community driven content. But there is that shift. You know, like there is a difference between just putting yourself out there, however which way, or doing it purposefully, you know, where it's um, it's driven by, you know, certain issues, certain community driven campaigns that are happening, you know, in under resourced, underserved communities, you know, like producing content that's really um, about building these communities, you know, harnessing these communities by the by the ways in which those community members feel that it needs to be changed. You know, so so I think, um, you know, that's the flow. It's it's really about um, having having that power, you know, and and that's a long process, I think, for some people, um, especially in an age where a lot of people's relationship tech to technology is about surveillance. You know, it's about being monitored um, again, you know, uh, using um, Oak Oak Park, is that it? The the apartments, as an example, you know, like not only is there gentrification and redevelopment, but there is this this culture of surveillance, like being watched, you know. So even though it's your home, it's like your relationship to technology is one that's evasive, you know. It's one that's aggressive, you know. It's one that disempowers you, right? So um, so of course, you know, there is this skepticism around technology, but. You know, there are projects out there. There are groups out there, you know, like Media Lines, like Some Can, like First Voice. That's really about shifting that, right? Really shifting it in a, in a way that's strategic, you know, in, in a way that really, really builds from and really, you know, pulls from, you know, the, the potential and, and, and the talent, you know, and, and the voices of communities, you know, that are most impacted, you know, by things like state-sponsored surveillance, you know? Um, consumer culture. So this is to either one of you. Uh, mm-hmm. Beyond representation, you know, just having the being able to see Asian faces or whatever. Uh, why is it important for us to even be talking about this um, and open up the the media access channels to, within our community, within the Asian and Pacific Islander community? community? And what are we trying to, you know, what are what kind of things are we trying to show or or, or open up for everybody? Mm-hmm. Maybe RJ can start. I think for the the Samkan project, which is still in its embryonic stages, it's this idea that um, you kind of deconstruct the the media making process. Process, and um, on that tip, um, I'll, I I will be working with youth. I would be working with youth to produce materials and and kind of ask and and eventually guide questions that kind of also demystify and deconstruct and. And make more transparent the city city planning and how that operates um, directly within their neighborhoods. Um, right now, they have a campaign on the eastern neighborhoods uh, plan that's uh, up for consideration. Uh, it's a pipeline project, and right now they're campaigning to get more housing and and these these very familiar conversations um, that a lot of the Soma residents have been experiencing. Um, but it's also about using the media to to create um, that space to deconstruct, demystify, but also empower, for one thing. Um, but also find relish in in the act of storytelling, in the act of sharing. So it's not so um, invasive. Um, it's not so limiting. Eloise, you know I'm. You know I. I um I completely share in that, you know, I, I think um, there is, a, you know, media is a tool for healing. It's a tool for sharing stories. You know, it's 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 a tool, you know, to make change, you know, um, from the bottom up as opposed to the top down. And that's key. You know, it has that it has that power and it has that effect. Um, and but at the same time, you know, um, we are uh, in a place right now where 
everything's being consolidated, you know, everything, um, newspapers, radio stations, cable stations, you know, um, magazines, it's all being consolidated by the same folks, you know, telephone companies, they're trying to consolidate the roads that, um, that people use to share information over the internet, you know, um, that sort of infrastructure, that digital infrastructure are essentially, you know, our, our era's railroads, you know, um, and it's, and right now there, there are huge fights in DC to make sure that the internet is free and open and not owned by one or two companies, you know, so that's really, I guess, big picture, you know, that's, that's what's at stake, you know, this, like, do we want, the stories of our communities to be consolidated by Fox News, you know, like that's, I mean, really, you know, what, what, what does Fox News, Fox News, how, you know, how would they ever understand or even, you know, spend 15 minutes, five minutes on what's happening in San Antonio, Oakland, you know, like, um, like there's, there's these huge consolidation efforts on all fronts in terms of the media. Um, and also just, you know, in terms of, you know, who owns property too? I mean, I think, um, I think it's very fitting actually when, when folks use, you know, digital storytelling practices to tell these, these stories of gentrification that's happening in Samkhan, that's happening in Fruitvale, you know, that's happening in, in these parts of the Bay Area and everywhere else. Um, I mean, that's one way where, you know, um, media is a tool to advance these sort of campaigns. So, um, you know, so many different ways. It's, it's so important to, um, to really take ownership, you know, to reclaim the media, you know, in this way by community groups, by community voices, by grassroots media groups. And, um, you know, there, there are folks that are doing that, you know, in different ways, different approaches. That's the voice of Eloise Rosalie, and also with us is RJ Lasada. And we do have to wrap up. We are running out of time, and we have to... Um, move on soon. I wanted to ask you, RJ, to tell us a little more about the SOMCAM um, project that you're working on and if there's information that you'd like folks to know how to get in contact with you. Sure, most certainly. Um, it's, it's, it's a dynamic approach uh, to blogging, if you will. Um, I'll be asking, for instance, one of the youth, Jeremiah, he, he always introduces himself as Jeremiah. I plan to be mayor of San Francisco. So it would be an interesting angle to kind of follow this young man in his pursuits and kind of respond to those questions. Um, and, the, and the, of course, there's oral history components that are, are still very vital. Um, but for more information on that, uh, feel free to visit the organization's website, somcan.org. And um, there will be a, a, a blog attached to that real soon. Thank you. And Eloise? Oh, yeah. You know, Media Alliance is very fortunate to be involved in a lot of different projects, um, but we're in the midst um, of uh, creating different uh, sort of projects, specifically in San Antonio, Oakland, and also in the Canal area in Marin. That's really about um, uh, bringing together, you know, different folks who are already very much grounded in those communities, providing different kinds of services. Um, in order to create community-owned infrastructure. So the roads that facilitate the distribution of community-produced content, you know, what that looks like, which is a very new thing, but it's a very exciting thing. And if folks want more information about that, they can visit um, the Media Alliance website at media-alliance.org, or they can call our office at 510-832-9000, and they can reach me directly at extension 302. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and we want to keep this conversation going in the future. We're going to go to a music break. This is Apex Express on KPFA 94.1 FM. We'll be right back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the magic touch you've seen every man out there and passed him off except one. Baby girl, that's what's up. I can't wait for the day when we hang and talk. I said, I'm not sure what you did to me, but I like it. I love it. Oh, I'm not sure what you did to me, but I like it. I love it. Said, I'm not sure what you did to me, but I like it. I love it. Oh, I'm not sure what you did to me, but I like it. I love it. Oh, every time that I get up on the mic. That's his new song. I like it. I love it here on KPFA 94.1 FM. And that is off his new album, Everywhere at Once. And we're your hosts, Ranjita and KJ, taking you through 8 o'clock tonight. And one of the consequences, we're going to take it back to um, World War II. One of the consequences of Japan's surrender to the U.S. after World War II was how to deal with Japan's colonies, namely Korea. Uh, we all know of the physical division uh, that Korea went through on the 38th parallel, but we hardly hear about what happened to the ethnic Korean population that migrated to Japan during, war, during the war. Um, up next, I spoke with Miho Kim, who is a third-generation ethnic Korean woman born and raised in Japan, and she talks about the Zainichi community and their complex experiences. She is a founding member of Eclipse Rising, a grassroots group made by and for the Zainichi community in the Bay Area, and she starts with what the word Zainichi means. The word Zainichi, um, technically transliterated to Japanese, means resident in Japan, and uh, basically, we're a product of the legacy of Japanese colonization of the Korean Peninsula um, that ended in 1945. As most people might know, during Japan's colonization of Korea, um, a lot of the resources were actually diverted for the Japanese populace, and a lot of the uh, low-income, uh, mostly peasant farmers um, had to seek jobs and survival opportunities across the sea. And at the end of World War II, there were approximately 2 million Koreans that were liberated on Japanese soil. And the majority of them did manage to return to their homeland. However, about 600,000 um, had to remain for one reason or another. The breakout of the Korean War 
was definitely one of the contributing factors. And my grandparents were, you know, one of those people who ended up staying and had my parents in Japan. And so that makes me the third generation. And、uh, to this day, the descendants of Zainichi Koreans, who are mostly second, third, fourth, or even fifth generations at this point, you know, use the Japanese aliases, meaning they use a Japanese last name to survive in Japanese society. Many folks have actually obtained Japanese、uh, citizenship, and another、uh, sort of a large number of Zainichi Koreans still retain、um, Korean nationality. But、um, unlike the times when they originally immigrated to Japan, we know that Korea was split into two nation states, and so the Zainichi Koreans had this choice, you know, to make whether to、um, choose North Korea or South Korea. So, what were the circumstances of your grandparents choosing to stay in Korea as compared to other Zainichi Koreans who chose to stay? Well, both my grandparents、um, are from a province in the southern peninsula of Korea, which I think was largely a rural kind of a rice farm, you know, type、um, region. And、uh, being from very humble, you know, peasant background, they didn't have a lot to go back to. First of all, and、uh, second of all. Cholera outbreak, you know, occurred, and also the boats returning back to Korea、um, was just packed, and some of the ships never actually made it, and you know there was just too many people、um, wanting to go back all at the same time, and so some people actually never made it for those logistical reasons, and yet others、um, kind of had, you know, started to make a life in Japan, and so、um, having you know multiple family members and things like that, I think it really made it difficult for them just to pick up and leave. So Koreans now make up the largest ethnic minority group in Japan, with over 600,000 people、uh, who have special permanent resident status. They've been systematically and socially marginalized, with many Zainichi Koreans being forced to hide their ethnic origins. But because of their long history within Japan, and with the new influx of migrants coming into Japan for work and otherwise. Many have touted Koreans as success stories. I've heard a lot of Japanese folks say that Koreans are now "quote unquote" reclaiming their identity and are now very proud to claim their Korean ethnicity. Talk about the complexity of the、um, of the hierarchy within the ethnic population in Japan. I think there's definitely some truth to be said about the current status of、um, Zainichi Koreans in Japan. Having, you know, remained in Japan and worked very hard, there's been that sort of a multi-generational accumulation of wealth and certain sort of social infrastructure dedicated to serving the needs of the Zainichi Korean communities at large. And so that's definitely something to acknowledge. And at the same time, it's interesting to note that there's still、um, ongoing assimilation policies in place. And、uh, assimilation policy、um, is basically a legacy of the colonial policies that Japan had promulgated during, you know, its、um, imperial era. And it seeks to assimilate、um, entirely those of non-Japanese descent into Japanese society. And to eliminate the very roots and sort of the consciousness, I guess, of、um, you know ethnic identity that might actually、um, conflict with that of Japanese. There's a number of laws that prohibit Zainichi Koreans、um, if they don't have Japanese citizenship.、Um, they are prohibited from certain rights. Those who do not retain Japanese citizenship to this day are not. Protected by the Japanese constitutional rights,、um, I was one of those people who, because I was born with the South Korean citizenship in Japan and raised in Japan,、um, it didn't matter that you know to me Japan was my only home that I really knew.、Um, when I was in middle school,、um, all the private and public schools in the Japanese school system denied、um, me entrance, and so compulsory education at that time we realized is not. Uh, right, we can take for granted, and also there's a lot of discrimination in areas of employment, and、uh, also in financial institutions, and you know those kind of institutions that actually play a critical role in ensuring certain opportunities for a lot of communities.、Um, Zainichi Koreans are legally barred from accessing those resources, and、uh, elderly Zainichi Koreans right now, there's many of them who still have absolutely no access to the pension in Japan, and so that's becoming a serious problem too because they're aging.、Mm. So you came to the United States in the 1990s, and you helped establish a community group called Eclipse Rising since you've been here. 
Tell us about the group and what you guys are trying to do. Um, Eclipse Rising is a very new group, and as far as I know, it's the first group that were formed by and for the Zainichi in the Bay Area. And part of the challenge for us is that although there may be some pros in looking just like Japanese, the con is that we're kept invisible from each other. And, you know, we pass as Japanese and we speak Japanese. You know, of course, we're born and raised there. And so that makes it extremely difficult to um, find each other to sort of forge a community. And, you know, over my years, um, just, you know, being active in the community, I was able to um, come across about five or six Zainichi women. And so we did um, develop a routine practice of meeting up regularly just over lunch or dinner and to really get to know each other. And then realizing that, you know, Zainichi community is just so extremely diverse. And part of it is the legacy of the politics of division that impacted the Korean peoples in the peninsula. But that boundary definitely existed in Japan too. And so some of us um, was raised in the Korean schools in Japan, which is associated with the North Korean regime. And there's, you know, somebody like me who was um, raised in a South Korean community. So you brought up a lot of the historic division and the pro-North, pro-South conflict uh, within your community. Talk about that. There's the Chongyun, those who pledge their allegiance to Mm -hmm. North Korea. And there's the Mindan, who are aligned with the South Korean government. Talk about that rift within the Zainichi community and how that affects life in Japan. The division is very deep. For example, when I was about 15, I actually um, went out on my own and uh, found a Korean language tutor. And um, around that time, I had uh, just started to come to terms with the fact that I was Korean because prior to that, I was just hating myself for having been born Korean. And um, I would blame my parents, you know, for having had me in Japan where, you know, Koreans were not welcome. And uh, that tutor turned out to be a graduate of a North Korean school or Korean school in Japan, which, as I mentioned earlier, is associated with the North Korean government. And so she taught me this word, tommu. And tommu in Korean is a word, I think it means comrade. Yeah. <laughs> and so I just blurted out that new vocabulary that I was very happy to have learned. And I was taught by my tutor that you use the word tommu to refer to a very good friend with respect. So when I blurted that word out at dinner, my parents just their chopsticks froze in midair and they said, what? And um, they got extremely angry and they started saying things like, what if you get abducted? Don't trust those North Koreans. You know, you don't go near them and don't ever go to her place again, ever. And they made me promise to them. Just their fear took me by surprise. But I think looking back, that was the reality of just how intense the distrust was and the division was within our own communities. Yeah, even to this day, people are caught at the crossroads. Like I said earlier, a lot of the Zainichi actually were one peoples when they crossed the sea to Japan and settled and they had the least involvement, if you will, in sort of the outcome of Korea being split into two countries. And so a lot of the people to this day um, uh, refuse to pick one or the other, in which case their nationality on the legal papers is indicated as Chosen, which um, in Korean is Chosun. It just means Korea. And there's no such country in the world today as Korea. And that renders them to be virtually and de facto stateless. Mm. And they don't have any access to um, services or resources that are provided either by the Chonyon or the Mindan and also are um, invisible in Japanese society and don't have any representation in the institutions. And so that's just, you know, some of the challenges that the complexities within the Zainichi community. Mm. And... Having grown up within a South Korean community mindset, you're about to go to North Korea very soon. Yes. So tell me why you've chosen to go. Well, I was finally naturalized as a U.S. citizen um, with very mixed feelings about a year ago. But the first thought that crossed my mind is now I can go to North Korea. Why is it so important for you? To me, it's important because I feel like Zainichi, uh, looking back, Historically, and even before the Zainichi, you know, identity was born, 
the developing sort of geopolitical affairs in the whole region、um, didn't take into account the interests of Zainichi. If anything, we were sort of a sore spot. Um, for the Japanese government that just wanted to put all the memories and the remnants of, you know, its own sort of history of aggression aside, and yet here we are insisting that we still have yet to see the day of liberation. You know, the way the Korean Peninsula might have been liberated, and for the South Korean government,、um, when it normalized relations with the Japanese government, you know, it was a military dictatorship in South Korea. Part of the agreement was. As a part of the diplomatic relations, you know, being formed, any individual Zainichi Korean would relinquish their entitled right to、um, seek compensation、um, by the Japanese government, whether it, you know it be a forced laborer or quote unquote comfort women and other people that might have suffered any wrongdoings. And North Korea, on the other hand,、um, took on a policy of not rejection or.、Um, Abandonment as South Korea, but quite the opposite. And so、um, their policy was to actually welcome, you know, Zainichi Koreans, quote unquote, back to the homeland.、Um, geographically speaking, it's not technically the, the homeland for many Zainichi who, who are from the south. But regardless, you know, over 90,000 Zainichi Koreans actually,、um, quote unquote, returned to North Korea. So you know, going to North Korea to me is sort of an effort to undo all of the divisive. Distrust that have been sort of really planted in our communities because I do feel like if you look at the bigger picture, Koreans for that matter and Zainichi Koreans as well didn't really have full access to the driving seat, you know, in terms of carving out their destinies. And I do feel that the people that are under the North Korean, you know, regime today, just as well as any other Koreans, have to have equal footing and voice at the table in order for the Koreans themselves together to figure out the path towards reunification. And I want to be a constructive force, and that is going to be what、um, provides a lot of the healing for the multi generationally transferred legacy of trauma and injustice for the Zainichi Koreans as well. So, if anyone who's listening wants to find out more about this issue,、uh, do you have contact information that you have to offer? We do have an email address, and it's eclipserising at gmail dot com, and that's one word: eclipserising at gmail dot com. We're going to end this segment with the commentary that Miho wrote about her upcoming trip to North Korea. I wanted to thank you,、uh, Miho, for coming into our studios this evening. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. The one thing I look forward to visiting in North Korea is the Imjin River. Imjin River flows from the north to south through the Korean Peninsula, right across the 38th parallel and the demilitarized zone. Back in the mid-50s, when a North Korean poet named Seong Park wrote the song Imjin River, he must have stood by its riverbank, watching the gushing water steadily flow downstream towards his ancestral land, amongst the vast rice fields in southern Korea. Wishing to be reborn as a bird, to fly over the river hundreds of miles away to the south. In the song, in fact, he calls out to them in yearning, "Please, messengers of freedom who know no borders, please tell me, who divided our motherland? Why can I not return home to the south? Who took my home away from me forever?" This song was banned in South Korea for decades. Because of its controversial pro-unification message, those who kept asking such questions were arrested and tortured because they posed a threat to South Korea's national security. No doubt, it was a criminal offense to ask such a thing. Twenty years after the Imjin River was released, far across the sea on Japanese soil, I cried out this very question in hysteria, covered in blood. Having just been rescued by strangers from a lynch mob of classmates, their teachers, and neighbors, except I asked my mother and not a bird. And my mother, instead of flying high up in the clear blue sky, buried her head low into her apron, as if she transformed into a trembling mass of flesh, sunk into the floor into the dark depth of nothingness. 
Though she said nothing, her tears told me, somehow, that she desperately wanted to give me an answer and tried hard to look, but could not, because she was inferior as a Korean, and I deserved no answer. Then we both wailed, mending my fresh wounds and stitches, for the god-awful curse to be Koreans in Japan. And so, I also learned at an early age through my mother's tears that this is a criminally awful question to ask. Clearly, I lived a colonial experience 30 years after colonization of Korea supposedly ended, and so did hundreds of thousands of other Zainichi Koreans who, despite being overwhelmingly from the southern rural regions of the Korean peninsula, returned to North Korea so they could finally live as Koreans, as human beings with dignity and pride, and join the cause for true liberation of Korean peoples from foreign occupation. Seung Park was a newly arrived North Korean returnee from Japan when he wrote Imjin River in 1957. He was finally home now, and yet, he still yearned from the long-lost home to the south. What's really tragic is that he, or any Zainichi for that matter, had the least to say in the installation of the 38th parallel, one of the most heavily fortified borders in the world. Just like they had the least to say in the installation of a Japanese colony on their territory half a century earlier. One hurdle after another befalls us, so massive, absolute, and beyond our humanly control, pushing the home we keep searching for farther and farther away from us, cutting off our spirit from the source of its very roots, one generation after another. Zainichi Koreans are those for whom the dream of being rooted, that solid sense of belonging, whether it be motherland, ancestral home, or adopted home, has always been a reward magnanimously bestowed upon us by the host nation state, whether it be Japan, South Korea, or North Korea. It's not free, but a reward for acquisition, if not performance of, a fully nationalistic identity and ethnic consciousness as prescribed to us. A Korean saying goes, fighting of whales break the backs of shrimps. Politics of the Cold War and ever-growing imperialist endeavors of the United States and its cronies like Japan have broken the back of the Korean peninsula as well as the Korean people, including the Zainichi communities. Thoroughly embarrassing, the U.S. demonstrates its sense of exceptionalism when it utters references like axis of evil for North Korea without any indication that it recognizes itself to have been the whale for as long as North Korea has been in existence, if not even longer. Standing on the riverbank of the Imjin River, I hope to pick up where Seong Park left off, seeking the very answer to his question, so that my generation is the last to shed tears that he or my mother did. Somehow, we must ensure for the next, if not the current, generation of Zainichi the right to redefine their homes as freely as the birds above the Imjin River and reclaim their roots like its ever-abundant watershed in the pristine mountains north of Pyongyang. And when all Korean people find their respective ways there, that's what I call reunification of a nation. And it looks like we're out of time, so that does it for us tonight on Apex. Uh, and the song you are hearing now is Injin River by a Japanese folk band called Folk Crusaders. And this is Apex here on KPFA 94.1 FM. We have been your hosts this evening, Kyung Jin and Rangita. Special thanks to the great Eddie Pei for taking the controls for us this evening. Um, I hope everybody has a good evening and a great weekend. Thank you, and please be sure to join us next week. What's a win-win situation? You, donating a vehicle to an organization that you believe in, and then claiming a charitable contribution on your next tax returns. It's easy. 
You can support KPFA, your independent public broadcaster, by calling toll-free 1-866-628-2277. That's 1-866-628-2277. Or visit www.vehiclesforcharity.org. More information is available at kpfa.org. See, a win-win situation. As always, we appreciate your support. 